so when when uh, I joined the Kurat Institute in, in uh, 1986, then um, Sylvan was there, looked exactly the same as today, and he <laughs> had been for a while uh, a very distinguished uh, distinguished uh, professor there. And uh, he, he is still there, a very distinguished, more, even more distinguished professor. And I have no doubt that when I die, he will still be there. He will still look the same. <laughs> and, and he will be a uh, distinguished apologist there. I very much miss that in recent years, um, I uh, um, couldn't, uh, didn't, couldn't participate in the geometry seminars because uh, uh, he was, um, uh, and I'm sure he still is, a permanent member of the geometry crowd. And uh, although he uh, he often didn't eat with us, but 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 just for the um, for, for for chatting, uh, he came with us to the restaurant afterward. And it was really very good to have him, uh, not just from the social point of view, but also from the professional point of view, because in many, many of those problems that um, we came across, we actually missed the topological background. So our, our knowledge was uh, kind of uh, complementary. And um, this is uh, how also our joint uh, paper was born that, uh, that uh, we, had, uh, we had some idea how things should be uh, and the topological part was uh, proved uh, single-handedly by Sylvan. So, and also of course, if, if Andrew was uh, the only real student of Ricky, Sylvan is uh, the oldest friend of uh, Ricky and Eli. Uh, and then their relationship uh, goes back a long time. So I'm very happy that he accepted to be the last speaker in this uh, event. Thanks, Ivan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm going to make some uh, remarks about my, uh, about uh, Ricky and Eli, about uh, some of the ba their backgrounds, some of how, why, and how, in many different ways, we all miss them. But I'll say those remarks at the end, uh, leading into the discussion about them <clears throat> in the half hour after the scientific part of this meeting is over. So I'll delay that to the end of my talk. So I'm gonna discuss today some joint work of myself with Edward, oh, is this working? Let me see, make this work. How do you, uh, let's see, with this pencil. No, what do I do when I do? Oh, here, maybe now. Oh yeah, there, okay. So I'm gonna be discussing uh, joint work with myself and e Edward Miller, who's a colleague here at Courant and is, I think, participating today. And uh, I'm gonna be discussing some work about graph theory, but there are analogs of the things I'm gonna be saying for matroids, also for oriented matroids, but I'm not gonna to get to discuss those today. I'll be focusing on the graph theory aspects. And uh, later, some future occasion, hopefully I'll talk about uh, related items for oriented matroids, generalizations of what I'm discussing. So we had a paper a few years ago, uh, in fact, in DCG, the journal which uh, we're celebrating and which uh, uh, Ricky and Eli co-founded. Uh, we had a paper there a few years ago on some combinatorics related to uh, graph theory also related to simplicial complexes. We did some things in that paper. And uh, we hit some themes, which I'll discuss today in the graph, which we've gone further with. And I'll be discussing those today in the graph theoretic situation setting. So uh, one of the things I'm gonna be looking at is formulas, which I think everyone here has seen some kind of formulas for this, but maybe there'll be some new ones for discussion. Formulas for, uh, the number of uh, spanning trees to begin with. And then we'll be generalizing that to other kinds of things as we go on, spanning trees uh, in graphs. 
Now, I think probably everyone here, or almost everyone here, will have seen the familiar formulas for this in some special cases. Uh, there is some famous old cases that are much well known. There's a formulas of Cayley, for example, that go back to the 19th Cayley, that go back to the 19th century, 1889. Uh, the for, that's for the fact that the number of, by the way, spanning trees, just so everyone, in case there's students here, spanning trees, trees are graphs with no circuits. These are trees means graphs with no circuit, graphs with no circuit. Or if I wanna phrase this topologically, it means that the, the, the group of cycles, uh, in a, so if I write T for tree, it means that the group of cycles in the tree with integer coefficients uh, is zero, is zero. So this is the cycles, the group of cycles. So there are no non-trivial cycles uh, in a tree. And there are formulas for the number of spanning trees in graphs, which are of great interest. One is this formula of Cayley's uh, 1889, which says that for the complete graph, uh, for the complete graph on n vertices, for the complete graph uh, on n vertices, there's a formula to the Cayley, which is that uh, it's n to the n minus two, and there are ways to explain that, which we won't have time to do. By the way, I'm not gonna get into too many technical details in general. Uh, this is the end of a long and productive and interesting day. Uh, I'm not gonna burden people uh, too much here with details. Okay, so, and then there's a famous formula uh, due to Kirchhoff. There's a formula due to Kirchhoff, which is uh, Kirchhoff's formula is, that's a 19th century formula also. And Kirchhoff's formula is in terms of a determinant associated to a Laplacian. And I'll get to explain what the Laplacian is later. And its determinant can be used to calculate the number of spanning trees in a graph. That's a very important formula. Kirchhoff uh, came into this subject by thinking about electrical circuits and forming the foundational rules for electrical circuits and their properties. And in the process of doing that, he was led to uh, find formulas for the number of trees in a graph, maximal spanning trees, I should say, the number of, well, spanning trees, yes, so it's maximal. Okay, so, uh, and um, Kirchhoff developed formulas for this. And one of the things we're gonna be discussing is other kinds of formulas for this and their ramifications in terms of related questions about eigenvalues of graphs, of matrices that arise from graphs and so on. And we'll be looking at various matrices that arise from graphs and discussing some of the geometrical meaning of their, of their eigenvalues. Okay, so here's another formula, which is due to Trent. Trent was, I wrote a paper, uh, I think it's 1954, but it hasn't been noticed as much as it should have, I think. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a paper in PNAS, Public, uh, National Academy of Sciences, 1954. He gave a formula, this is a formula, which is kind of interesting. It's quite a different formula from the Kirchhoff formula. In fact, the formula involves a different sized matrix, but still the determinant of the formula of the matrix comes in. And it says that there's gonna be a certain matrix, which we'll call, uh, the, there's gonna be a certain matrix, which I'll explain in a minute, the mesh matrix. So the mesh matrix is gonna study how the different cycles uh, intersect each other in a graph. I'll write it down explicitly in a moment but we're gonna produce this matrix. And then we're going to see that the number of, again, the number of spanning trees, the number of spanning trees inside a graph, in a graph, let's call the graph G over here, is going to be equal to, it's gonna be given by the size of the determinant of the mesh matrix. So this is what happens, something similar to this is what happens also with the Laplacian matrix. This is a different matrix. As I say, it's not even the same size, but the determinants uh, give you formulas for the same quantities, actually. So what do I mean by the mesh matrix? Well, let me write down, draw a picture of an example, and then I'll give a definition, which would be the obvious thing in a way. So for example, let's just take a graph. For example, let's just pick a graph that has homology of rank two, just so that it's not entirely trivial. Let's suppose I have a graph which looks like this. And there's a certain number of vertices here and a certain number of vertices here. 
and a certain number here on this leg. So this obviously has a uh, bedding number, first bedding number equal to two, uh, the rank of the rank here of the number of cycles uh, in this graph with integer coefficients is in this case is obviously equal to two. And let's suppose for simplicity, I'm just gonna, well, I'm gonna orient all the edges, but for to make life as simple as possible, I'll just orient them all uh, kind of coherently. So these are going up. Let's suppose that there are say R of these, and these are going uh, this way, let's say again, and let's suppose there are P of these. And similarly, I'll have these over here, let's say all going with this orientation that way. And let's suppose there are Q of these. So these three numbers, P, R, and Q, describe a family of graphs. And now what will I mean by the mesh matrix? Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at a basis for the cycles, look at a basis of the cycles, of the cycles, that's this group, which I call Z1, that's the usual notation for cycle. Look at a basis for the cycles and count their overlaps and count their overlaps with signs, count the overlaps, possibly multiplicities and with, and with signs. So for example, in this case, the matrix is really quite simple. There's only two cycles over here. There's one cycle that goes around this piece there's another cycle that goes around this piece. Of course, there's other bases I could use. The basis is certainly not unique. For example, I could have used as a basis, the big uh, oval going around the whole thing as one of the basis elements. But let's suppose I pick these. Then, well, what do these things overlap in these cycles? Well, I'll get a little two by two matrix that describes how these things overlap. And what does that matrix look like? Well, uh, this one on here on the left, this one obviously, any overlaps itself in all of these cycles. There are P and R together. So that's P plus R, if I can squeeze that in. That's P plus R. Then these two cycles, the one on the left and the one on the right overlap in R uh, edges in the middle. So the off diagonal elements here are R. And then the, the one on the bottom, uh, the one on the right is Q plus R by the same reasoning. And so I get a little two by two matrix. This is a lot smaller in this case, certainly, than the Laplacian matrix for this graph. Uh, this is the mesh matrix. In this case, it's just two by two. And in general, it's an N by, it's at the same size. Uh, it's, it's K by K, where K is the rank of, uh, of, the, uh, of the cycle group. And now if I take this matrix and I just take its determinant, so if I take the determinant of this mesh matrix over here, I see that what do I get? Well, there's a cancellation because R squared is occurring twice and I get PQ plus PR uh, plus QR. And you can easily convince yourself that that is actually the number of maximal trees in this graph. This two by two matrix, just two by two computes that for you because in order to get a spanning tree, you have to remove a pair of edges, pair because the rank is two, and for example, you could remove one from this piece, I'm, I'm darkening it, and one from this piece, uh, that would give you a tree. So that would give you the PR piece. And similarly, if you pair, remove one from another pair of those circuits, you would get the PQ piece and then the QR piece. And the theorem is that, of, of uh, Trent's theorem is that in general, this gives you a way of computing the, uh, the number of spanning trees. It's an interesting and quite different way to compute uh, the number of spanning uh, uh, trees for a graph. And one of the things we're gonna be discussing today in my joint work with Ed is uh, going to be the uh, questions about the eigenvalues of this matrix and its significance. And uh, with one of the things we're gonna be looking at a little bit later in the talk, uh, a little bit later, it's not too long from now, given how uh, short this has to be, but what we'll be discussing is there are uh, it, first of all, there is interest in understanding not just the determinant, but we're interested in, let me just say, we're going to be interested in characteristic polynomial and its interpretations. Uh, and all its coefficients. So that's one of the things we're interested in, the characteristic polynomial. And then we're interested in geometrical meaning of the eigenvalues of this matrix. Now, to the experts, it's well known, let me say right off the bat, it's well known to the experts that for the Laplacian, for the Laplacian matrix, 
for the Laplacian matrix, which again, I haven't gotten to define yet, but I think I will. Uh, but anyway, it's a familiar thing. For the Laplacian matrix, the eigenvalues have very rich geometrical meaning, which is much studied, uh, for example, in the book of Fan Chang and in many other places it's studied. And in particular, there are what are called Cheeger inequalities, inequalities, inequalities that relate, that relate the eigenvalues, or at least the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian. They relate this to the geometry of the graph. Of the graph. And if I have time and I'll get to it, I hope I will. One of the things we want to study is, well, here is a, another matrix, quite different size in general, that uh, has a related determinant, can't have this anything like the same eigenvalues because it's a different size even. Nevertheless, what we're gonna be seeking is, we're gonna be trying to understand what about Cheeger type inequalities, Cheeger type inequalities? Well, they'll involve different geometric quantities. They won't be the same geometric quantities that arose for the Laplacian matrix, but we will be discussing the question of Cheeger type inequalities for the mesh matrix. Uh, and we actually have a couple of different kinds of Cheever type inequalities, but they involve different geometric quantities. But again, they get related to the first eigenvalue of this matrix, for example. Okay, so let me say a little bit about the characteristic polynomial and eigenvalues uh, of this matrix in the little time that we have to discuss this today. Uh, I think I may have stuck into the title optimistically something about matroids. And in fact, uh, it is part of the program that we have that some of what some of what I'm going to be saying, some, not everything, but some of what I'm discussing, will we, we are generalizing to, to uh, oriented matroids. But I won't get to discuss that at all today. That in some future. Uh, presentation then. Uh, okay, so let me say a few things about character. Oh yeah, before I go on, I wanna point out one bit about the geometry, which is useful to observe, which is that uh, there's a uh, 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 trends theorem is quite general. If you take a basis, as I said, of integral homology, you get trends theorem, but you can make things more geometrical by picking a basis adapted to the geometry of the graph. So we're going to pick a basis we're going to pick a basis by a certain uh, geometrical process, by a geometrical, or pick a, maybe I should put the words in the other way, or pick a geometrical basis for the set of cycles uh, in the graph uh, with Z coefficients by the following process, by the following. Well, let's, let, let's for simplicity just, I could work with non-connected graphs but let's for simplicity just assume that G is, uh, uh, G is connected. If not, I have to introduce the notion of far forests, which is unions of trees. But let me just work, suppose that the graph is connected for the moment. Uh, and then let's suppose we pick a spanning tree. So let's let F, let's let F equal a spanning tree. Uh, the number of these, as I say, uh, come into various formulas that we've been discussing, but just let's pick one. Well, this gives us a canonical way to pick a basis for homology, because once I have a spanning tree, once I have a tree that's uh, spanning like that, every other edge, every other edge, all the other edges, all the other edges, uh, they don't, they're not by themselves elements in the cycle group, but they, they give me in a natural geometrical way, every other edge, um, I'm so, so here's another edge, for example, let's say here, every other edge, let's say, oh, I'm assuming, let's say the edges are oriented here. So if I had here an edge, let me say EJ, for example, let's say EJ typically will give me a cycle actually here in an obvious geometrical way, there'll be a cycle that, that you get from this. Because if you take an edge and you just, run through the tree from the front of it to the back of it, 
you'll go all the way around and come back around. And so that gives you a cycle. Now that's not a cycle. Uh, that's a cycle which you know can be a little complicated, but it's a natural choice of them once you have the spanning tree. So we, we're going to use, uh, we can say some theorems without this preferred choice of, uh, of a basis, but for some results, the geometrical meaning is clearer if we use this kind of geometrically motivated uh, basis for the cycle group, for the cycle group. So that's a basis that from the, for the rest of this talk, make life more concrete, I'm going to be working with those kind of geometrical bases for the group of cycles. Okay, uh, so now uh, let me, uh, okay, so, uh, so I could look at the characteristic polynomial, for example, of this sort of thing, and it turns out the character, the core, uh, maybe I'll just summarize because time is tight, I see now. So I'll just summarize and say that the characteristic polynomial, the characteristic polynomial with respect to, formed by, with respect to this basis, with respect to this basis, uh, has coefficients. which measure, well, for example, uh, for the jth coefficient, for the jth one, let's say, if I organize this appropriately, for the jth one, how many trees there are, how many spanning trees trees intersect the one I started with, F, uh, in J or, or, or N minus J, depending on how I organize, let's say in J, uh, in J edges. So I could write down a formula for that actually, but I think I will uh, leave that out. Uh, I'll just say that the characteristic polynomial measures interesting geometrical properties about the uh, ways in which the trees intersect each other, uh, spanning trees intersect each other uh, in the graph. Uh, so that's an interesting fact about uh, generalizing uh, Trent's result. I'll also mention another, uh, I only have time to mention a few of the topics that we've been thinking about. So that's what I'm gonna do. Another thing, one can, interesting question one can ask is, how do you relate, how do you relate uh, Laplacian's, uh, Laplacian's matrices uh, and mesh matrices and mesh matrices. Uh, well, there's one case, uh, it's interesting to see that there's sometimes one can be interpreted as the other. Uh, let me draw a picture of how that happens. And it's interesting partially because it also leads you in the direction of what the conjecture, uh, but since there are already known facts about Laplacian matrices and what they mean and what they geometrically correspond to and what their eigenvalues mean, it's a strong guide to what you should be trying to do for mesh matrices to think about cases when these can be interpreted in terms of each other, which can happen sometimes. So here's a setting in which that can happen for what's called the cone graph. So let me just mention cone graphs. Cone graphs are graphs that look like this. Uh, there's, a, there's a paper which talks about them by some years back by someone named Cook but he doesn't discuss the kind of phenomena that I'll be focusing on today, but it's an interesting paper, a useful paper. Okay, so uh, let's suppose I have some graph G and now let's suppose I take another, I add another point outside and here I have vertices and edges in here. And now let's suppose that I just draw, I, I add now to my graph, I'm gonna produce something called the cone graph, cone of G. And that's gonna be the following. You take this point, this new point out here, and you add new edges that go from this point, this kind of cone point, to all the other edges that you already had. So you expand your graph by adding this. Now, if you do that, there's an obvious, uh, uh, there's an obvious uh, tree in here, or forest, uh, well, group tree actually, in, here in this case. So this is gonna be, there's gonna be an obvious tree over here, let me call it F uh, or F zero here. There's an obvious one, which is you just look at those cone lines 
from the cone point that you added, right? You added the cone point and cone lines, and uh, and so you get a new graph now with, of course, more edges, the number of more vertices, the number of vertices, uh, no, um, more edges, more vertices, uh, one more vertex, and many more edges, and uh, and now. It's not going to be, I'm not going to write it down the details again, but I'll just say that one can, we, here, there's this natural choice of this tree. So there's this spanning tree over here. And well, notice the picture is very simple-minded because every time I had an edge down here in the old graph, G, I get a cycle in the new graph by going up to the cone point and back, this little triangle each time. So the edges, so the edges in the old graph the edges in G uh, lead lead me to uh, lead me to uh, cycles. Well, in fact, uh, uh, in fact, using let's say using the the maximum F zero as the maximal tree in the for the cone graph for the cone of G for the cone of G, the edges here give give me cycles. Uh, uh, over here, so uh, I can now start comparing. I can start comparing the Laplacian over here, the Laplacian over here. I can start comparing with the uh, with the mesh matrix, with the mesh matrix over here, and I can start comparing their eigenvalues. Well, they're not identical. There's a shift, but anyway. I'm not going to have time to write, I'm not going to write down the formulas. But anyway, there's a relationship back and forth here between the Laplacian and the old graph and the mesh matrix and the new one. And that helps us think about uh, what conjectures should we form about the eigenvalues of the new graph. I'm not going to, I think I'm going to eschew writing down any formulas uh, over here because of shortness of time. So maybe I will. Uh, uh, there are also nice formulas for interpreting uh, some of the some other things about these coefficients, which I won't do. I think what I want to do because I want to get to this is, and I want to get to my remarks about uh, uh, Eli and uh, Jacob, uh, Eli and Ricky. So uh, I will. Uh, I think I'm just going to say something about Chigo inequality, just to give the flavor of what we're just talking about. So let me discuss for a minute or two in the same informal and incomplete style. I'm going to say something about Chiga, in, Chiga inequalities. So, uh, so the classical Chiga inequalities are, are in the following kind of situation. You look at the, uh, uh, you look at the, so the, the uh, Laplacian matrix delta of the graph G here is given by uh, it's given by the degree that's that's a diagonal matrix minus the adjacency matrix. Uh, 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 really. Sorry, am I okay? Anything? Okay. All right. So uh, I'm, that's and now the, there's a theorem of Chigurh's uh, which uses the uh, what's called the Ritz Rayleigh type inequalities Rayleigh type inequalities. Uh, and what that does is it gives you, you look at the eigenvalue. So lambda one is going to be say the first, the first non-zero eigenvalue, the first not zero. It, the eigenvalues are going to be positive for the Laplacian. They're also positive or non-negative, I should say, for the mesh matrix, kind of for the same reason, because the Laplacian has a, can be written in the form of a, a matrix A times A transpose. And the mesh matrix also, can be written in the form of B transpose times B. They both have that form. And that's what, even though they're different size matrices, they both can be written that way. Uh, uh, and so that's a useful fact, which has implications, of course, about their eigenvalues and that gets used over here. Anyway, the Chigurh inequality says that there's a relationship between lambda one, the first eigenvalue, and uh, an isoparametric, isoparametric, Parametric. Uh, it occurs in an isoparametric inequality, uh, which I don't think I'll write down. I think I'll just say what it is. Uh, so it's about taking the vertices, and if you divide them into a set and its complement, if you take the vertices and you divide them into a set and its complement, 
Lambda one is related to the number of vertices you see in A and B and the number of edges that cross from A to B. So it kind of measures how much is the interaction between A and B. It measures the relationship between the interaction and how many edges cross from A to B and how many vertices are in A and, B, and, how, many, how, and how many vertices are in A and B. And it's an inequality that says that lambda one uh, is less than or equal to some formula involving this isoparametric phenomena, the phenomena of how much is on the edge of these regions compared to what's happening interior to them. And that's what the Cheeger, very valuable Cheeger inequality is. I am told that this Cheeger inequality plays a role. Uh, I was once told by someone who worked in Google that it's why Google got ahead of all the other search companies that we used to use. Okay, anyway. Uh, so there, it turns out that there are Cheeger type inequalities proved by somewhat analogous, not identical methods, but using the same kind of ritz rolle uh, principle. Uh, and uh, we have them for uh, well, the mesh matrix also. So if I let mu, if I let mu be the, uh, the smallest, again, no, uh, uh, eigenvalue here, the small, and these are again, uh, non-negative numbers, the smallest eigenvalue of, uh, of the mesh matrix, then, uh, then there's an inequality that says something like, well, uh, let me say it in words, it's something like this. Uh, it says that mu is, uh, is majorized by some quantity. Uh, and again, I'm gonna be taking a bunch of, e of edges and dividing them into a set and its complement. Actually, the edges, the vertices that I'm gonna be using here are gonna be the vertices, uh, uh, I'm gonna be using, uh, well, okay, so, uh, for simplicity, let me just assume that the outside of the maximal tree, I don't need this assumption to say this, but it makes the pictures easier. Let's suppose the outside of the maximal tree that I'm talking about uh, is connected. For example, uh, say is connected. Uh, then uh, uh, it's gonna be that the formula is going to involve the same in the denominator of the quantity like the kind that comes with the Chiba's formula, oddly enough. But in the numerator, it's going to involve something that we call the flux. Uh, the flux uh, from A to B, let's say, from A to B through the tree. So this is a sum. If you imagine that every A is walking over to a B. And then as it does that, it crosses through the, that tree that we started with in order to find the basis of homology. And then we, what we do is we take, it's actually a sum of, uh, of amount that walks through the tree, uh, but counted with signs, by the way. So there could be cancellations uh, in this, but it's some sum of these fluxes. The flux from A to B, this is some sum uh, of, the, uh, of those paths through the tree. And then you take some sum and then you, you square that, that quantity. Uh, I think that's all I'm gonna say about it because I'm already almost over time. Uh, but this will be all in our forthcoming paper uh, soon. Uh, I do wanna say a few words because I feel I have some special, particularly valuable uh, connection to, uh, to the two people, men, great men that we're honoring today. And I wanna say something special about them and my relationship to them because I knew them in many ways. Uh, I had the advantage over most of you of seeing them. Well, Ricky, I saw almost every day, certainly every week for many, many years. Eli, I saw not quite as frequently, uh, but very often also because he was coming by all the time uh, to work with Ricky. And I benefited from them in many ways. So I would say, first of all, I benefited professionally. They didn't talk me out of, they didn't try to talk me out of leaving geometric topology. I've stayed in that, but they did interest me. And I think in a way that's affected me deeply into geometric combinatorics. And I've attended their seminar and benefited from them and some conversations with them. And they led me into the subject gently by having me collaborate with them as the topologist uh, on some projects. And I'm very grateful to them uh, and, uh, and will always be so. But I'd like to say a word about them in other dimensions because they were extraordinarily multidimensional people. And 
uh, they, that you could have discussions with both of them, each of them separately and both of them together about a vast range of historical subjects about which they were immensely knowledgeable and very deeply interested uh, about music. We've already heard a little bit about Eli's interest in music, about literature, about so many topics. I mean, they were really people of extraordinary culture in a way that's not so common uh, here in the States, I guess. And I, I would like to say that they, they also, it wasn't isolated from other aspects of themselves. So they, 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 they both came from a certain kind of ancestral uh, Jewish, Eastern European, democratic socialist backgrounds. And I don't know that that was their politics, but it, it, they took from that certain values and virtues and qualities that have stuck with me and which I very much enjoyed in them. And uh, one of them, is that on the one hand, and, and these things might sound like they're in contradiction, but in them they weren't. On the one hand, and and on the one hand, they were deeply interested in, in what you could fairly call elite intellectual culture in music, in literature, and in and, and other things as well. On the other hand, they had that uh, socialist view that the masses should be brought into that world and that proper education and given the right opportunities the masses can be brought into that. And that was part of their hope for the future. That was what they saw as part of the hope for the human future in their optimistic view uh, of life. So they had, uh, they combined a kind of a democratic feeling, a very democratic uh, feeling with a kind of uh, uh, elite intellectual values in a way that was very distinctive. And I think represents part of the best of the culture and the world that they came from. So anyway, I benefited from them so many ways. I miss them because I saw them every week. I miss them every week. And uh, so uh, anyway, it's a terrible loss, but it's also a wonderful heritage for all of us. So I think that's all I want to say right now. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Janos, I have a comment on the last talk. May I? Yes. Uh, the interesting part of the last talk for me putting the cultural aspects of it on the side that it relates different areas of mathematics together. And I would to add another comment on this, that the concept of flux and what gets out of the set of vertices of the graph is also well studied in theory of computation. And this is a concept that is used also to bond the convergence rate of certain random graphs or Markov chains that are actually defined on graphs in probability theory. Appears to be that all these concepts relate to the last concept that you view it differently from another angle and multi commodity flows also. Thank you very, very much. Interesting very interesting. interesting connection. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, who, who, uh, I, I couldn't see, sorry, who, was, who made that last suggestion? Farhat, 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 Farhat. I'm, I'm Farhat Yeah, I did some work in multi commodity flows, and and some of the concepts that you introduce here in terms of uh, flux and other things are well studied problems in multi flows. And there's been some historical papers by Leighton and Rao that formalize these things actually, and look at near optimal duality theorems. And that, and that, and then later these are used in terms of showing work of people in probability theory uh, to bond the convergence rate of uh, uh, actually a certain, a certain randomized algorithms. And so, so fairly, fairly general concepts that relate to many areas of uh, mathematics and theory. Thank problems. you very much. Perhaps we can be in touch further. Sure, I, would, I, 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 I can send you an email. Great, thank you so much, thank you.